Uh, my name is Fanula O'Neill, and I'll be giving you this um, presentation today on um, meadow grasses and bent grasses. So, uh, just to give you, um, a, a, just to first of all thank the project supporter, which this year is National Parks and Wildlife Service of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. So it's great. Um, this Irish Grasslands project is, of course, an initiative of the BSBI. So it's, it's great to have their support again this year. But today's webinar, um, I'm, I'm going to cover just to do a quick recap on the structure of grasses so that we all are singing from the same hymn sheet when we're talking about the different parts of the plant. And I'll start with meadow grasses then, um, looking at the characteristics of the genus. To look at the main species found in Ireland and Britain and how you distinguish them from each other. And then with bent grasses, exactly the same characteristics of the genus, what are the main species and how to distinguish them. So the structure of a typical grass plant, if there is such a thing, and you know most of them share the same characteristics, you have the non-flowering shoot, which is often referred to in texts as the tiller, and this consists of the roots, the stem and the leaves. So essentially this part of the plant, the roots, the stem and the leaves of the plant and the leaves attach to the stem at a, a bulge called the node. And then the flowering shoot, which is often called the culm, is uh, <clears throat> it includes the flowering head or the inflorescence, which arises from the top of the shoot. Now the grass leaf, which is probably one of the main parts that we would use for ID purposes, consists of two main parts. So you've got your leaf blade, which in texts will often be called the lamina. And we have the lower part of the sheath, which is, if you like, wrapped around the stem, and that's called the sheath. Um, and here at the junction between the leaf blade and the sheath, you've got a few other things going on. Um, which again can help with identification and I'll um, explain those just a little bit uh, further on. So sometimes um, a key will ask you does the leaf taper gradually or is it parallel sided and usually you can tell by looking at it for example this one here it's very obvious that it's tapering but if you're not sure then just fold the leaf over in half to see if the upper third of the leaf is the same width as the lower third. And that'll tell you then if, if the leaf is tapering gradually or if it's parallel for most of the sides, uh, for most of the way, and then narrowing um, quite suddenly to the tip. So the ligules and the oracles then, what, what are these? So just to recap, as I say, your, your leaf blade and your sheath um, joined together um, at um, the junction between the leaf blade and the sheath, you have often um, a flap of tissue called the ligule. And this can be um, either membranous or it may consist of a rim of hairs. Uh, now, not in the species we're looking at today, um, but your ligule can also be very long and pointed like this, or it may be quite short and truncate like this one here. Um, also, you have what are called oracles, uh, which are um, little outgrowths or ear-like projections from the side of the, uh, from the base of the leaf. And this um, can be diagnostic as well. Now, as it happens, neither Poa nor Agrostis have, um, have oracles, so it is not something you're going to use in IDing these species, but certainly if you see any oracles, then you know it's not a poa and it's not an agrostis. So that in itself is useful. Um, sometimes on the sheath as well, you can see um, little hairs maybe present on parts of the sheath. And this will come into one of the species of poa. So ligules, just this is quite an important point for you to, to make for you to, um, for you to be aware of when you're looking at ligules on plants. Ligules on flowering shoots are usually longer than those on vegetative shoots. So if you're using a key, then you really need to know what type of shoot your key is referring to. So for example, if you're using a vegetative key, which is only looking at the vegetative parts of the plant, 
and not at the flowering, uh, the flowering head, then you only look at ligules on non-flowering shoots. If you're using a key to flowering grasses, then you should check maybe the second or third ligule from the top of the flowering shoot, because sometimes the, the one at the top can maybe be a little bit um, different in character to, to the ones further down. So if you take nothing else from this webinar, I think um, just take note of this point. Ligules can vary depending on whether it's a vegetative shoot or whether it's a flowering shoot. So just, you know, be, be mindful of that. And if at all possible, use the freshest material that you can as well. So rather than, you know, getting a ratty piece of sort of dead or dying grass, um, just have a hunt around and see if you can find a nice fresh piece with all the ligules and everything um, intact and all the, the characteristics of the, of the grass as they should be. So in terms of vegetative spread, grasses have a number of different uh, methods, if you like. Um, they may spread by ab above ground horizontal stems called stolons. Um, and from once the stolons um, touch the ground at the node, then their adventitious roots um, will be produced and a shoot can arise from that, or indeed a number of shoots. There are also below ground horizontal stems, which are under the soil, um, which can often be scaly. They're, they're not going to be green. If, if you see any green parts on one of these structures, then you're talking about a stolon because it's above ground. So underground horizontal rhizomes and very short rhizomes then can give rise to tufted plants. And long rhizomes give rise to large patches of grass. So, for example, the likes of you know, Hulcus mollus or you know, um, any of the Hulcuses, they will tend to have uh, a much more mat forming sort of growth. So here, for example, on the top uh, left, we have an example of creeping habit, which is this is actually a grass of Stolonifera. So you have you can see your stolons there creeping out from the edge. And this would be common in, in lawns like my own, maybe, which isn't particularly well managed. Um, and it's spreading out from its, um, it's spreading out across the concrete via stolons. And then this other habit here is tufted habit. Now, this is neither Poa nor Agrostis. This is actually Yorkshire fog, but it very nicely illustrates the tufted habit, um, which is just lots of individual shoots arising from the same point. Here again are stolons and across to stolonifera, um, just photographed this week in uh, Roscommon. So you can see some colonizing agrostis here with your stolons creeping out from the main plant. And uh, this one here in particular, nice and long and just spreading across the nice bare um, peaty ground here. So in terms of the reproductive um, part of the, of the grass, so the flower head, uh, I know this is quite a busy slide. I do have um, diagrams to um, just to illustrate these points. But just to run through it, the inflorescence in Poa and Agrostis, the flowering head is what's called a loose panicle, um, which bears many uh, spikelets. And each spikelet then is held on a little stalk called a pedicel. And it consists of a number of parts. So first of all, you've got the lower and the upper glooms, which protect the developing spikelet. And within those glooms, then you have one or many florets. And a floret just consists of the flower and two individual bracts. And these bracts are the lemma, which is the larger outer one, and the palea, which is the inner smaller one. And the flower itself, of the grass consists as a normal flower does of your female um, pistil, your male stamens. And in the case of grasses, you have two little scales called lodicules, which are probably the, the remnants of sepals and petals. So just to, um, to give this the pictorial um, run through. So this is again, um, 
The panicle here is Halkus linatus uh, because it's quite a good one to illustrate nice uh, chunky head. So you've got your spikelets, individual spikelets here held on um, an inflorescence. You have the kind of central spike or central stem of the inflorescence, which is the ratchet. And then the spikelet is attached to the ratchet via a little tiny stalk, which you can barely see there. And then the spikelet itself, you have your lower gloom here, which is the outer one. You've got your upper gloom, which is the inner one. And then these two glooms enclose all the spikelets. Okay, so each of these individual spikelets here. This is quite a, a nice um, illustration here of, um, this is Bromus hardiaceus. So you can see the spikelets here are uh, very definite and very obvious. So this is one spikelet. These are the glooms down here. And within each of those, you've got your florets. So again, just in diagrammatic form, you've got your two glooms at the bottom. You've got your florets. These are your florets here. Sorry, I was referring to them incorrectly earlier on, but uh, you'll forgive me for that. Um, so these are your little florets. Within your floret, you have your lemma, which is the outer bract, and you've got your palea, which is the inner bract. Now it's important um, to know the difference between um, your various different bracts here, because your lemma, which is, um, as I say, the one that is within the, the floret, this is your lemma here. This is useful in um, IDing plants, in IDing grass plants, whereas the palea is not really used that much in ID at all. So you're mainly looking at your two blooms, which is the bottom of the spikelet, and you're looking at your lemma, which is the, the bract, the bigger bract in the little florets here. Hopefully that's clear enough. And just to recap on the spikelet structure, so you have one or more florets in a spikelet. Your spikelet is surrounded by two leaf-like glooms. And in this particular example here, you have two florets. So here you have your lemma, your palea, your floral, um, these are your male parts. Here again, another floret, your lemma, your palea. And within that, we can't see them, are the, the anthers and the pistil of the grass flower. And your upper and your lower gloom. Okay, so that's your spikelet structure. So useful to remember this because when you're referred to a key, then these are the characters that you'll be having to, to think of. So things to check in your spikelet then, how many florets are there? So for Agrostis, um, there's only one floret per spikelet. In Poa, there are two or more. With the glooms, which are the two brats at the base of the spikelet, are they the same size? Are they sub-equal? So sort of almost the same size, but maybe not quite. Or are they completely different sizes, one much bigger than the other? How many veins are in each of the glooms? and how many veins on the lemma. Is there an awn, which is the bristle uh, that you find on some grasses? Um, if there is an awn, is it on the gloom or on the lemma? Does it arise from the tip or from down the back of the, the lemma? And is it straight or is it bent? Grand. Okay, so uh, bent grasses, uh, agrosta species are uh, the next group to look at. So this is a, a sward, if you like, of Agrostis capillaris. So you can see uh, the sort of feathery look to the head. Um, and if, if it grows on a swathe like this, it, it can look quite distinctive with a sort of a, a nice hazy brown look to it. So again, quite a, quite a pretty grass um, when it's uh, occurring like this. So Agrostis uh, genus includes some very common species um, among our, our most common grasses in Britain and Ireland. Um, as a genus though it's it's very variable and you can actually find quite a bit of variation even within the same species. The one thing that is constant is there's one floret per spikelet um, and this can give some of the plants um, quite a delicate feathery appearance which is which is very nice but it also 
makes it quite difficult to see the floret details. Um, it can be quite hard to dissect tiny little uh, agrostis flowers. So quite often um, you might rely on um, the vegetative characters of agrostis quite a bit when you're trying to distinguish bet between the various species. So the vegetative characteristics then that you might be looking at is um, the, the leaves are flat and finely tapering. So they're, they're not parallel sided, they do tend to be finely tapering. Um, sometimes in, with say, the, the likes of Agrostis vinealis, it, it can be quite bristle-like, um, but usually um, they'd be maybe a few millimeters wide at the bottom and then tapering towards the top. They can look quite nondescript. Um, I've, I've heard them called boring green grass because they, there's not really that many characteristics you can, you can kind of hang your hat on. Um, but anyway, that's, it's certainly a contrast to the um, meadow grasses, which have that, that boat shaped tip. So the shoots are rounded and they're not flattened. Uh, the youngest leaf is rolled in the shoot and the leaves are hairless. Okay, so, so that's useful as well. The ligules, vary uh, from short and blunt in some species to long and pointed in other species. There aren't any auricles, so there's no little claw-like outgrowths at the base of the leaf um, blade. And the leaves are ribbed, so some are more strongly ribbed than others. Now, we're not talking big massive ribs like in marron grass or something, but um, if you fold the leaf over your finger and have a look at it with your hand lens, Hold it up to the light. You can see sometimes there are sort of little ribs, um, just um, ridges, if you like, uh, going along the length of the leaf. And if you hold the leaf up to the light, sometimes you can see these ridges as well, these, uh, these little ribs. So that can be useful too. So again, just to give an idea of um, the distribution or the relative distribution of these species in Ireland. Uh, this is from the National Biodiversity Data Centre, uh, the number of records in their database. Uh, Agrostis dolinifera, hands down most common Agrostis in being recorded in Ireland. And the next most common then is Agrostis capillaris, followed by Agrostis canina. Um, this would be um, canina without, just the, in, in the strict sense, and then followed by Agrostis vinealis. So Agrostis gigantea, uh, you will sometimes see as well, much more common in Britain than in Ireland, and Agrostis scabra, very rare indeed. So I'm just including the species of Agrostis which are found in both Britain and Ireland. There are some other rarities that are found only in Britain. Um, I haven't included them. So this is the distribution of Agrostis dolinifera in Ireland and Britain, and as you see, pretty much everywhere. Agrostis capillaris is also pretty much everywhere. Agrostis canina, slightly less widespread, particularly in the, the centres um, of the countries. And Agrostis vinealis, um, quite a bit more um, sparse again. Now, part of that could be um, just a lack of recording, people maybe overlooking it or not, not knowing, because um, it, it's quite a tricky one to distinguish from Agrostis canina. So I look a little bit at the characteristics that will help to separate the two of them. So be aware um, when you're recording, if something looks like a canina, it might actually be vinealis. Agrostis gigantea, black bent, so again, much more common in Britain um, than in Ireland. Um, not quite sure, I think it might be introduced in Ireland, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, Agrostis scabra, very rare, and Agrostis castellana, which I didn't realise occurred in Ireland until recently. Um, there's just one little point down in Limerick, um, and it's it's little bit more widespread in, in Britain. So the first species to look at of uh, Agrostis is creeping bent. Um, so as its name suggests, it, it spreads by means of stolons, uh, these creeping overground stems, you see them here, they travel um, along the surface of the ground. Where the nodes touch the ground, you have little adventitious roots forming and the plant spreads that way. 
Now this ligule here, this is a um, diagram from Hubbard. The ligule is often going to be a little bit more ragged looking than the nice neat triangular point you see there. And it might sometimes be kind of truncate, slightly truncate, so a little bit cut off at the top. Again, the fresher the material you have, the better, okay? So if you're looking at a grostis from later on in the season, then, well, it's probably going to be a little bit, um, bit more well used looking. Uh, so the fresher you can get, the better. It also tends to have this, this slightly more contracted panicle, especially after flowering. So a grossa stolonifera um, quite often grows in, in swards and inundation grassland. And there's, there's not really a whole lot of grasses that will, that will exist in completely flooded uh, grassland. So quite often you'll find uh, Glyceria, Fluitans and a Grossa stolonifera forming a swathe. But even more often, you might even just find a Grossa stolonifera on its own, just happily growing in completely flooded grassland with very little else growing with it. So if you see this kind of situation and you see a triangular green, boring green grass, triangular leaf, slightly purplish stem, um, stems and leaf sheets, then it's probably a Grossa stolonifera. Agrostis capillaris, on the other hand, is uh, much more a species of drier places. So the inflorescence, the flowering head, is usually very fine and delicate. The panicle is very open, um, even after it's finished flowering. It favors dry kind of acidic conditions, and the leaves can be either soft or stiff. And the plant itself is tufted, and it spreads mostly by short rhizomes. Occasionally, it can spread by stolons as well. So it doesn't necessarily follow that every agrostis you see with stolons is going to be stolonifera. You need to look at other characters as well, like the ligule and so on, because you might just have um, a case of agrostis capillaris with stolons. So this is, um, again, the BSBI um, handbook diagrams. The main difference that you can see really between them is the length of the ligule. So a grossus stolonifera, quite a long ligule. A grossus capillaris, much, much shorter. A little bit of a difference as well in maybe the size of the, of the glooms. Um, but um, to be honest, there's, again, the, the floral parts of grossuses are so small, it's really quite difficult to, um, to use them for ID. The contracted panicle here, so this is after flowering um, and even sometimes before flowering, it, it can, a grossus stolonifera can have the slightly contracted panicle as well, um, whereas grossus capillaris tends to remain open. Um, and the, yeah, the stolons for a grossus stolonifera are very characteristic um, and a grossus capillaris tends to be a little bit more tufted. So just to recap on that, uh, Grossus stolonifera spreads by stolons, Capillaris spreads by stolons or rhizomes. A Grossus stolonifera has a medium ligule with a point, which is often ragged, um, whereas a Grossus capillaris has a short ligule, which is not pointed. So think of flat cap um, for capillaris. A Grossus stolonifera is often in damp or inundated habitats, but grows pretty much everywhere, to be honest whereas the grossus capillaris favors drier habitats, especially kind of poor acidic soils, just like these sort of dry um, conditions. And the inflorescence of a grossus stolonifera contracts after flowering, whereas the grossus capillaris, the inflorescence tends to stay open. Now to look at a grossus canina, velvet bent, um, it has a long pointed ligule, um, a few millimeters long, it's tufted with slender creeping stolons and the leaves are bright green or sometimes a gray green. Um, the leaves are short and narrow, so they're maybe one to three millimeters wide, really quite, um, really quite delicate looking. Um, the lemma may have an on, but this is very variable. So sometimes there's a bristle on the lemma. And a grostus canina favors damp or wet places and it can actually be locally abundant forming a, a, a soft kind of green carpet. 
Whereas Agrostus vinealis then, brown bent, again, has a long pointed ligule. They, as I say, there's quite a bit of confusion between these two species. They do look similar. Um, and Agrostus vinealis tends to grow in dense tufts, so more dense than Agrostus canina. And vinealis spreads via underground rhizomes. The leaves are green, again, or gray green, but unlike Agrostis canina, the leaves are stiff and narrow. And again, they're one to three millimeters wide, and sometimes they, they can be quite bristle like. Um, again, the lemma can have an awn um, or not. Uh, sometimes even it varies even on the same um, panicle. Um, but unlike Agrostis canina, it favors dry habitats and both acid and calcareous dry habitats. So it can, it can crop up um, no matter what the pH, but it does prefer dry conditions. So Agrostis vinealis was formerly known as Agrostis caninus um, subspecies, sorry, SSP, Montana, um, and you'll sometimes see it referred to in books as that but it's probably underrecorded as it's often overlooked or people just confuse it with Grostis canina. Um, just to go back um, to the, the soft carpet of Grostis canina, I've come across it in the likes of some of the damp drumlin grasslands in the Midlands in Ireland and around Leitrim and Longford, where it, it's in sort of an acid, uh, a humid acid or damp acid grassland and it, it really does form a very soft carpet of kind of limp leaved grass, very bright green, very thin leaves, which just cover um, cover the surface of the, the soil. So it's very distinctive when you see it growing in a, in a patch like that. You would not see a Grostis vinealis growing kind of um, prostrate or, you know, limp leaved like that. Much more erect plant and much drier habitats. So just to, uh, to look at the, um, the BSBI handbook drawings, as we were saying today, spot the difference, you know, there's not that much difference. Um, perhaps Agrostis vinealis is a bit more tufted um, and it does have um, rhizomes, whereas Agrostis um, canina, the tufts are a little bit more um, loose, I suppose you could say. The other thing as well is Agrostis vinealis tends to have that sort of contracted inflorescence after flowering as well, similar to Agrostis dolinifera, whereas Agrostis canina tends to stay a little bit more open. But in terms of the ligule, really quite similar. Pointed ligule here for Agrostis canina and you know, Agrostis vinealis is pretty pointed as well. Now on the diagram here, it looks a little bit more, you know, long and rounded rather than long and pointed, but um, I'm, I'm quite sure that's going to vary from plant to plant as well. So always, wherever you can, just to emphasize, get the freshest material that you can and take heed of whether you're taking material from the vegetative shoot or the flowering shoot and know what your key is actually asking you to look at. Okay, that's important. So just to recap the differences then between Agrostis canina and Agrostis vinealis. So the habitat, Agrostis canina generally grows in wet places, whereas Agrostis vinealis generally grows in dry places. The leaves of Agrostis canina, the leaf blades are limp and they cover an area like a soft green carpet, whereas Agrostis vinealis leaves are firm. And post flowering, the inflorescence of Agrostis canina usually stays open, and that of Agrostis vinealis usually contracts after flowering, at least to some degree. There is a bit of a difference as well with the upper gloom um, in that Agrostis canina only has one vein on the upper gloom, whereas Agrostis vinealis might have three veins. So it'll have the one long central vein and two short um, side veins, one on either side of the, the middle vein. Now they can be quite short, so it may not always be that easy to see, but if you do see it, then that can be used for character as well. 
Okay, so I, I hope that has helped uh, with um, both your, your POA species and your Grasta species. So, okay. That's great. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Funila. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating and asking lots of lovely questions.